The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them Jesus addressed this parable. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here I am dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to the father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with the feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field and on his way back he neared the house. He heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, look, all these years I served you and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat to celebrate with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fatted calf. He said to him, my son, you are with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, first of all, I want to thank you profusely for being good Catholics. And you're probably saying to yourself, well, what constitutes being a good Catholic? You set your clock ahead last night. Thank you. And that means you are entitled, and you won't hear me use the word entitlement very often because I don't like that word, but you are entitled to a nice nap this afternoon. And that brings us to our gospel. And I remember teaching this passage for years and, and the research that I did on this passage during my graduate studies on Luke's gospel and just being absolutely amazed at what I discovered. As I share with you, first of all, the passage has been actually misnamed for centuries. We call it traditionally the parable of the prodigal son. But as I will explain to you momentarily, the focus is really not about either of the sons. It's about the father. And what it says is incredible and even absurd. First of all, a man has two sons, we're told. This is a Jewish father. And the younger son comes to the father and says, 
give me the share of the inheritance that's coming, from, that is due me. Now what's interesting, first of all, the older son is the one who talked to the father. There was a pecking order back then in the family and in society. The younger son would have never taken the initiative to come to the father and especially to demand his share of the inheritance. You see, first of all, in Jewish law of the day, the older son was entitled to two-thirds of the father's estate, the younger son one-third. And the father could disperse his holdings in two manners. He could write a will so that when he died they would get the money, or he could actually give it to him during his lifetime if he so desired. But the book of Sirach, and this is interesting, in chapter 33 verses 19 to 23, cautions a father from doing that and for obvious reasons. You'll spoil your kid. But this man decides to do so. Now what's interesting, that the son comes and demands his share of the state is tantamount to his walking up to the father and saying, drop dead. Drop dead. Because that was the likely way that he was going to get the money to begin with. And Nick, I'm sure if one of his kids came up and said, dad, drop dead and give me your loot, I'm sure Nick would say, sure, honey, sure, no problem. As all you fathers would, right? But he does. He does. It's unthinkable. And I'm sure the Jewish people in the audience hearing Jesus tell this story are probably going, oh, oh. And the son takes the money and he goes off and he squanders it. Luke says, on a life of dissipation. He allows you to fill in the blanks in terms of what that is. But let me tell you this much. They didn't have cell phones back then and they didn't have iPads. But in a small community like that, word traveled quickly about Joe Jones's boy and what he did. And you know what? It made the father look shamed. How could your son do such a thing to you? What kind of father were you? People would have asked. And then the son blows everything to the point that he is destitute. And what does he do? Something actually even worse. He goes off to Gentiles and hires himself out to these Gentile people. They know he's a Jewish boy. They can tell the way his hair is set. And they're so anxious to have him come and take care of their pigs, all right, because they can't stand Jews, nor could Jews stand them. And so here's the picture of this younger son, up to his neck in pig manure. When he appears to come to his senses, it would seem, he says, you know, here I am starving to death. The, the, the slaves on my father's estate are eating food. I can't find anything to eat. None of these Gentiles will give me anything. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of this mess. I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And for centuries people went, Aww. Aww. God bless him. Ah. Ah. Well, Savior, ah, because he really is playing a game. He's not really contrite. Listen to his words. I'm going to go back to my father so I can get something to eat. And I'm going to say to my father, Father, treat me like one of your hired hands. My point is this, brothers and sisters. After what he got through doing to the father and the family, would it not have been appropriate for him to go crawling back on his hands and knees begging forgiveness and mercy, treat me like a slave? No. He's going to go back and say to his father, treat me like one of the hired hands. That is a blue collar worker with benefits. And so there he goes back with his half-baked, half-contrite speech. And then it gets more amazing. The father at a distance sees his son coming towards him. What does he do? He takes off running towards the son. Please note, in ancient Palestine, as in Palestine today, 
men never ran and they don't run today. Well, for mortars coming in on their position, they'll run. But back then and even today, men walk around in a stately fashion. The women do the running, the children do the running, not the men. But the father's running towards his son. He's desperate. He wants him back. And so no sooner that he's within earshot of the father, he pushes the play button on this recorded speech. And he begins to say, Father, I've sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. And the father won't even let him finish. He says to the servants, quickly, put a robe on him. Put sandals on his feet. Sandals was the mark of a free man. Slaves did not wear sandals. Three men wore sandals. So what the father is saying to him by commanding sandals be put on his feet, he's saying to the son, you're free to do it to me again if you want to. And then the most absurd gesture. He puts a ring on the son's finger. This is the family signet ring, you see. This son has just gotten through telling the family, I don't want you. I don't want any of you. And now the father's saying, we want you back. We want you back. We want you back desperately. And then the celebration began. Well, the older son, and how many people have said, and probably you said as well, I feel so sorry for the older son. Perhaps we can feel some compassion initially until you hear the details. He's been off doing the father's work all day long and it's been a long day because it's evening time when he comes back. He's followed the father's plan for years, but here's the problem. He gets close to the house and he hears something like a rock concert going on. And he's saying to himself, what's going on in our house? Because you see, the father would have had the older son, the firstborn son, at his right hand side to welcome the guests. That was the custom. He was the father's namesake. He was going to inherit the majority of the estate. He would have known about the celebration well in advance because it took time to kill the fatted calf, to make the wine, to grow the vegetables, and so on. But it's happened so spontaneous. The older son comes back and guess where he gets his information? From a slave. He goes to the slave and says, what's going on? What's going on? And the slave looks at him as if to say, you're the oldest son and you don't know? Well, allow me to tell you. Your younger brother came back and your father threw this party. And can you imagine the embarrassment, the hurt, the humiliation, the shame? He was supposed to know all of this stuff. But the father acted so ridiculously spontaneously, uh, he refuses to go in, and you can't blame him, can you? So the father comes out looking for him. And he says, son, come on, let's go inside. And he wants nothing to do with the party. Look what he says to his father, and very disrespectfully, I might add. You know, he says, I've been working for you all these years. Don't you remember me? Remember your son? I've been working for you all these years hard. Never even asked for a goat to celebrate with my friends. Then that son of yours, notice he doesn't call him my brother or name him as Joe. He says that son of yours comes back after squandering your money on a life of destitution and you welcome him back and throw him a celebration? The father can only say one thing. We had to do this. You don't understand. We had to do this. He was lost and he has come back. He was dead, but he's alive again. Absurdity, ridiculous generosity, compassion that goes off the limits. That's what we're talking about in this story. Now, I'd like to share with you another story that's a bit more contemporary. One that perhaps some of you can relate to, or perhaps you've all heard in one shape or form. The story is about a woman who was actually raised in a poor family. 
One day she met the man of her dreams, a wonderful person, a very wealthy and, and very wealthy and she could not believe her ears when the day came and he asked her to marry him. After the wedding, they moved into a beautiful suburban residence and lived in surroundings she had only seen in the movies. God was indeed smiling on her. Then tragedy struck. One day she began to feel extremely ill. It was a feeling she had never experienced before. She eventually went to the hospital where the doctors denied, diagnosed her illness as terminal. The impact that the diagnosis had on her, as you might well imagine, was devastating. She suddenly felt that God had withdrawn his love from her. In a fury, she wanted to go tell God off. So in her hospital gown and robe, she struggled down the quarters on her way to the chapel. It was to be a face-to-face -face confrontation. She felt so weak, however, that she had to support herself by bracing against the wall as she moved along. When she entered the chapel, it was dark. No one else was there. She proceeded up the center aisle on her way to the altar. Through what seemed like an endless journey from her room to the chapel, she had been preparing her speech. Oh God, you are a fraud, a real phony. You've been passing yourself off as love for 2,000 years, but every time someone finds a little bit of happiness, you pull the plug rug out from right under their feet and cancel your love. Well, I just wanted to tell you, I know what you're all about, and I've had it. You are fickle, and I can see right through you, God. In the center aisle and near the front of the chapel, she fell. She was so weak, she could hardly see. Her eyes could barely read the words woven into the carpet at the step of the sanctuary. She read and then repeated the words. The words, you are my beloved. Then she put her tired head down over her crossed arms and listened. Deep within herself, she heard God say, you are my beloved. Finding her place, her way back to her room, she slipped off into a deep and peaceful sleep. You are my beloved. You know, that woman's life is very akin to the prodigal son. He was blessed, she was blessed. He turned away from the father, she turned away. He returned, and she would return. You know, in the Christian life, when we look at our spiritual selves, we tend to make a mistake. And the mistake is this. As long as I'm good and I'm faithful, as long as I'm a, a holy person, then God is good to me. I don't have to worry. But then all of a sudden, hurt occurs, pain hurts, things happen, tragedy strikes, whatever the case may be. And we say to ourselves, God doesn't love me anymore. God stopped loving me. Why? Why has he withdrawn himself from me? And you see, it's during those times that we need to remember another story from the scriptures. It's in Luke's gospel as well. And it's in chapter 4. And the scene is this. Jesus has just been baptized by John the Baptist. The heavens opened up and a voice said, You are my beloved, my chosen one. And then the Holy Spirit drove Jesus, says Luke, into the desert. Where for 40 days he was tempted by Satan. And as we know, Satan always gets us at our weakest point our most vulnerable point. And where did he get Jesus? Where he gets us, our identity, who we are inside. And so he went after Jesus. He knew Jesus was hungry and he says to Jesus, hey, you know, if you're beloved, then God will feed you. Turn these stones into bread. You'll have all the bread you can eat. Remember Jesus' response? 
He quotes from Deuteronomy. He says, not by bread alone does man live, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Translated into today's words, I know I'm beloved by my Father. Just because I'm hungry and I'm hurting doesn't mean that he does not love me. He loves me and I will remain faithful to him. Satan couldn't get Jesus to trip up. He couldn't convince Jesus that somehow his father was on another planet somewhere and forgot about his only son. No, Jesus knew that no matter what happened to him, the father was there for him. I've had people say to me, well, well, you know, Father, what about Mark and Matthew's gospel? You know those words of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't sound like somebody who feels beloved by God, does it? It doesn't, does it? Really and truly, if you stop and think about it. It sounds desperate. It sounds horrible. It sounds pained. But you know what? Mark and Matthew only give us the first verse of the scripture that Jesus quotes from the cross. It's from Psalm 22. And yes, the first verse says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But listen to some more verses. For he has not spurned nor disdained the wretched man in his misery, nor did he turn his face away from him. But when he cried out to him, he heard him. So by your gift will I utter praise in the vast assembly. I will fulfill my vows before those who fear him. The lowly shall eat with their fill. They who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your hearts be ever merry. And so a student said to me, well, if that's the rest of the words in Psalm 22, how come Jesus didn't utter the rest of those words? Why did he just utter those agonizing words? You want to know what my answer was? <laughs> so that you Catholics wouldn't be lazy when it comes to knowing your Bible. He gave you the first verse and he's saying to you, go look up the rest. Will you do that after Mass? Psalm 22. Back in the 16th century, one of my favorite saints was called by God to do a dirty, dirty, difficult task. Teresa of Avila was her name. She was a Carmelite sister. And God called her to go clean up the church in Spain. Oh, what happened to the church in Spain? The monasteries, the convents were polluted. People weren't living their vows. They weren't living holy lives. God said, Teresa, go straighten those people out. And one of the nights that they grabbed her and threw her in the dungeon in a dark cell, she would utter the following words. God, no wonder you have so few friends the way you treat them. Ever feel like that with God? Yeah. But you know what? Teresa knew that God had not withdrawn his love from her. She knew that she was beloved by God. So my brothers and sisters, my point is this. There's a lot of people out there who are angry with God. A lot of people out there who are convinced that because something horrible happened to them, God doesn't love them anymore. And I say a story to you with permission. Sue Ellen Ensign gave me permission to say this. She came in to talk yesterday. Sue Ellen Ensign, for those of you, is a young mother in our parish who's been battling cancer quite courageously. But she was telling me where Satan spoke to her this week. Satan spoke to her. And what did Satan say? You're not beloved by God. <laughs> God's forgotten you. And you know what she said to Satan? Be gone. Be gone. I am beloved by God. My point is this. God never forsakes us. At times in life when the tears are so heavy in our eyes, we can't see God. Sometimes our ears are so polluted with stuff and pain that we can't hear God. But like that woman who collapsed in that chapel only to open her eyes to see the words in the carpet, you are my beloved, God is there. So I ask you to consider the following, what God wants you to know. Yes, you are ill but you are beloved. Yes, things are going wrong in your life, 
but you are beloved. Yes, you are fed up, disgusted, and hurt, but you are beloved. Yes, people have gossiped about you and stuck you in the back, but you are beloved. Yes, you are hungry, hungry for love and acceptance, but you are beloved. My brothers and sisters, God never leaves you. You leave Him, and He's always there waiting for you to return. Waste no time during this Lenten season. If you think God has withdrawn from you, think again. He's there for you as He promised, not just today, but even until the end of time.